who is from Galloy, so a Galloy man on the Galloy stage, and I think he's unmasked. Well, come up, come on, Jose. Um, this jam, but when you started with Galloy, uh, how long have you been with Galloy? Now? Oh, I've been with Galloy for about a year, about a year now. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And then, how did you how did you get into Bitcoin? How how did that happen? What's your what's your Bitcoin story? I'm very new to Bitcoin. Okay. I, I used it a little bit back, you know, yeah. years ago, but really getting into it, it was it hasn't been since like the pandemic, and then joining Galloy. Okay, and what what attracted you? What what uh, made you come in, or what, what was uh, the moment you said, okay, I I, I got to join this uh, Galloy thing? Uh, I would say. Many things, obviously, yeah. kind of the direction of the world. Okay. Uh, but maybe like the most important thing was, well, I was a scientist at the time. I was working in a lab, and okay. the lockdowns made it so I couldn't keep working. And okay. well, I kind of started deciding, okay, we need something better to make decisions like this. And Bitcoin is the answer. Bitcoin is the answer. Yeah. Perfect. And these days, um, where are you based? Are you in the United States or are you in El Salvador? Like, uh, I'm all over. Are you all over? Yeah. And the first time in El Salvador? And uh, This is my first time in El Salvador, yeah. Okay, okay. Great, great. Cool. Um, yeah. So, um, the stable stats thing, um, how is the traction? You, you have any, any news on that in the, in the, in the app? Um, maybe you're looking into this as a data scientist, like what the, what the, what the Bitcoin Beach is, is doing there with stable stats. Is there a lot of traction for this? Uh, because it was one of the main requested features, I remember. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so in El Salvador, I guess, a lot of the competition, Bitcoin wallets have some kind of USD kind of stability feature. And so stable stats, yeah, is a very requested feature. And we, we're definitely seeing a big pickup in adoption of USD wallets, but you know it's it's kind of like a complicated additional feature. Bitcoin's already hard. Mm -hmm. Having the ability to switch and send USD over Lightning makes it a little bit even harder. So it's it's slow but growing. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Okay, and um, is there a Galloy workshop um, later on? You, you know about that? I think they they have a yes. Um, Daniel Wingen who is I think doing a, a presentation on the working with the with the Galloy stack. And uh, very good. We also have another data scientist like Aloy who's presenting on stable sets. Well, not on stable sets, but on the free option problem when you have one asset, but you're sending over the Lightning Network in Bitcoin, mm -hmm. there's uh, some issues you have to account for. Perfect. I think uh, that's a four ish. All right, all right. Yeah, so um, I think um, we could kick it off. What will you talk about? So I'm going to be talking about the, the inbound liquidity arbitrage on the Lightning Network. Okay, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Stage is yours. Okay. Jose, please. Wow. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm very excited to be here and talk with you today about this work that Nicholas and I published around a year ago on, on this problem of pricing pricing fees for network usage on the Lightning Network if you're running a bank or a Lightning-enabled wallet. Okay, so before I even get to the talk, I just wanted to say two words about, you know, this, this, this talk's about Bitcoin banks. Um, and, and the reason I care about Bitcoin banks and people like Galois care about them is because we think they're the most viable route we have to scaling for mass adoption. And our mission is, is something like we want every organization from the biggest governments to you know, the most local communities to giant corporations all to be able to compete and run sovereign Bitcoin banks using open source software and open research to operate these banks. So, okay. <coughs> okay, so one of the most important things a bank does is facilitate payments for its customers, right? Um, and in Bitcoin, you need liquidity to make payments. And the simplest kind of liquidity uh, you might need to make payments is on-chain liquidity. So you need some Bitcoin in a hot wallet that you can send when your users want to send on-chain payments. And we're going to, for the talk, we're going to represent that as like one nice orange square here as kind of like a single unified pool of liquidity. Now, 
With Lightning, you also need some off-chain outbound liquidity. So, so this Bitcoin is not immediately available to make on-chain payments, so it's kind of separated off in a separate pool of liquidity. And um, it's not uh, equally liquid like on-chain Bitcoin is. So it's separate off into separate little pools, each of them representing something like a lightning channel, right? Um, and you can use this Bitcoin that's locked in these channels, not to make on-chain payments, but you can make off-chain payments with them. And then lastly, you also need off-chain inbound liquidity. So this is someone else's Bitcoin that's locked in a channel with you and that uh, can be used to receive payments on the Lightning Network. So you need all three different kinds of liquidity and the natural question becomes, okay, how do I get more of these liquidities? If, I, if, if I'm running out, how do I balance my different liquidity pools? And so, uh, you know, this is probably very simple for most of you, but uh, it'll get more complicated. So uh, to get more off-chain outbound liquidity, we have a channel transaction called the open channel. And basically, you take some of your on-chain liquidity and you lock it in a channel with someone else and now you have it available to make off-chain transactions. Uh, again, you can do this in reverse. If you want more on-chain liquidity, you know, if your bank's running out of Bitcoin to send on-chain, you can take one of these channels, close it, and you know, after some time, it'll be available again to make on-chain transactions, part of your on-chain liquidity pool. And then this final operation uh, is for getting more inbound liquidity. So for that, what you need to do is accept an incoming channel from someone else, right? And this is a little different than the other two in the sense that now it doesn't seem as unilateral anymore. Uh, but what I want to argue is that none of these operations really are unilateral, right? Um, all of these channel creation and closing operations are cooperative. And when you know, it, that's most obvious when, you're, when, you, when you want more inbound liquidity because you need to get someone else's Bitcoin to be locked in a channel with you. And in, in that scenario, well, you could just pay someone to do that for you, right? You could pay someone to open a channel to you and then you can get th that inbound liquidity. But you can also pay with reciprocity. And this is kind of, um, this is a very common thing actually on the network. This is the kind of thing that uh, Rings of Fire or Lightning Network Plus communities offer people, it's kind of a way of saying, okay, I understand that uh, these operations are cooperative. I need inbound, you need inbound. If we both open channels to each other, or if we open a channel together that has both of our Bitcoins locked in it, then we can both benefit. Um, and, but this also brings in these other operations, right? So you, you need to use your open channels transactions, not just to open to wherever you're going to get the best outbound, but maybe you want to use them to also incentivize people to get, give you inbound. And same with the close. You don't want to close channels when you're, being, when you're engaging in kind of a reciprocal game with other nodes on the network. And, you know, obviously the last way you might be able to get inbound liquidity is if you're going to be able to pay your peers with routing revenue. So if your node happens to have a lot of flow going through it and other people know it, they might open channels to you. Um, but again, this means that you probably don't want to be closing channels all the time to rebalance um, because the shorter a channel's lifetime is, the less fee revenue you're going to be able to make on it. Okay, this is all background, but uh, the, the main point is something like if you're going to have an imbalance flow between your different liquidity pools, that's going to be difficult to manage as a bank, right? So you can imagine... And this is kind of the problem we had when we started this research. So you can imagine your bank, you have some nice balanced liquidity pools. Your users start receiving a lot of payments on Lightning and sending a lot of payments on chain. So now your liquidity pools are kind of becoming unbalanced, right? You have too much off-chain outbound and too little on-chain liquidity. And so well, the obvious thing is, okay, let's close one of these channels, get some more on-chain liquidity, and now we're, we're good again. But you can notice that... Um, you do no longer have this inbound liquidity that, that you started with. And so, obviously, you're going to have to get someone to open a channel with you and pay for it. Okay. And this flow is, you know, it's actually, you can do this and, and it'll work, but it'll just keep getting more and more, you'll have to keep doing it faster and faster and paying for more on-chain transactions 
and kind of locking your Bitcoin up, waiting for confirmations as the usage of the bank increases, right? So this imbalance flow, in this case from uh, off-chain to on-chain, can be a big problem for banks, and it can be very expensive. Um, and not only that, but it, it, there's second-order effects of managing your flow with these channel operations. So here I'm showing you a node on the Lightning Network, the, the loop node, that, oh, I don't like this, that, uh, that has a, a lot of imbalance flow. This, this node receives tons and tons of Bitcoin off-chain, sends a lot of Bitcoin on-chain. In order to remain operational, it has to open and close channels at an extremely fast rate. And you can see that here. You can see the average lifetime of a channel that's connected to Loop is much, much lower. It's like on the order of a day compared to the rest of the Lightning Network, where channels stay open for hundreds of days, right? So uh, that's, that's a consequence of this managing an imbalance flow. But like a bigger consequence is the cost. So <coughs> here is the incoming proportional routing fees to the loop node um, compared to the rest of the Lightning Network. And you can see that you know, fees are generally very low on the Lightning Network, less than one bit. But uh, if you're trying to route the pool, it's going to get a lot more expensive. And, and the reason for this is obvious, right? Pe if, if your channel is going to be closing really fast, you need to be able to recoup the cost of opening that channel. And you, so you're going to have to charge a higher fee. Um, OK, and, and if you're a bank, you, may be in this, you don't really probably want that. That's probably a negative second order effect of managing your liquidity by opening and closing channels because it's going to mean that your users, whenever someone's trying to pay them, they're going to have to pay high routing fees to just get the money to the bank. Uh, so ideally, there'd be some other way to do this where you don't actually have to end up with these huge incoming proportional fees. OK, so the solution was kind of in the last slide already. Um, it's this protocol called submarine swaps that kind of lets you outsource all of these channel operations, the things that end up with the second order effects of high incoming fees to another node in the network. And so the way this works is you have your nice balanced node. Again, your users receiving a lot of off-chain Bitcoin, sending a lot of on-chain payments. You want to rebalance. Instead of closing any channels or anything, you simply send all your off-chain Bitcoin that you want to Loop or to another swap service, and they'll send you back some on-chain Bitcoin. And so now you've kept the same channels. You haven't opened or closed any channels, but you have plenty of inbound liquidity, and you have plenty of on-chain liquidity. And your users can continue receiving off-chain, sending on-chain without any problems. So that's very nice, obviously. And it has even more benefits than that. Um, the first benefit that it has, in addition to that, is that you get multi-hop liquidity. So not only can you be sure that you know, your channels have inbound liquidity, but you, can, you also know you don't, you don't have to worry about your peers not having any inbound liquidity themselves, right? because you've routed through them. So you know that they have some inbound liquidity. And, but this multi-hop liquidity comes with an additional cost in addition to the channel operations which is that you have to actually pay for the routing to the swap service. And uh, as we saw before, that can be very expensive. And then it has another benefit that you don't have to open or close channels. That's very nice. Um, but since someone else is going to have to open and close channels, in this case, Loop is going to have to open and close a lot of channels to kind of provide the service, they're going to charge you a fee, right? They have to recoup their costs of on-chain transactions and having the capital there to do all of these channel operations. So these submarine swaps can be expensive, they, but they very much simplify the process of keeping your liquidity pools balanced. Well, I'm going really fast. OK, great. All right. So the, nat the next question that kind of arises is, well, so these submarine swaps are expensive, simple. How big of a difference can there really be between managing your liquidity with a submarine swap and managing your liquidity by opening and closing channels. Right? If you're a bank, you need to evaluate, well, are we going to use submarine swaps? Or are we going to open and close channels? Um, and so you want to kind of understand what are the different market forces that 
shape the prices of these uh, services or these different ways of getting inbound liquidity. And uh, you know, the first thought that might come to mind is that a submarine swap is trustless in the sense you don't have to worry about the reputation of the swap provider. You know you're going to get your money if, you, uh, if you're honest. So really, the, the amount of com the, the competition for like providing cheap swap services should really drive those prices to you know, the bare minimum, to just the, basically the cost of the on-chain transactions plus some additional uh, tiny margin. Um, and so this kind, of, this kind of thinking led us to the, uh, to the realization that really there is a kind of arbitrage that happens keeping these submarine swap services, keeping the prices for these submarine swap services kind of similar to the opening and closing costs for new channels. And here's how that works. And this is kind of the, the meat, the, the most important like, insight from the stocks. So if you remember anything from what I told you so far, this is what to pay attention to. So the inbound liquidity arbitrage. I think this is a very important idea that kind of shapes the market on the Lightning Network. And uh, I think it's beginning to be understood by more and more people, but it's been very useful for us at Galois. So the idea is, let's say you're some node on the network. You have some on-chain liquidity. You have some off-chain outbound liquidity, some off-chain inbound liquidity. What happens if you open a channel with a swap service, say? Well, OK, so you open a channel, meaning you take some of your on-chain liquidity, you lock in a channel with the swap service. Obviously, when, you, when it starts, all the Bitcoin on that channel is yours. That's fine. But what will quickly happen, because these swap services need to be receiving off-chain a lot, is uh, that that Bitcoin that's in your channel with the swap service will quickly get sent over to the other side, right? All the Bitcoin that you have in the channel with loop will end up in loops, um, in loops out of the channel, and your other channels will fill up. So now you'll have no more inbound liquidity on those channels, and then very soon after that, loop will just close the channel because they'll need that Bitcoin to send on chain. And so now what you've ended up with is you have the same amount of Bitcoin as you started with, minus a very, you know, uh, some small or potentially some very large profit from the routing fees, um, but you have no more inbound liquidity. And so if you, if you like that profit from the routing fees you got by routing that Bitcoin to loop, you're going to want to get some more inbound liquidity so that you can keep doing this process, right, and keep earning a kind of yield on, uh, on your inbound liquidity. So the, the, the main thing becomes for like one of these nodes that's doing the arbitrage is you want to sell inbound liquidity to whoever's going to be willing to pay. Uh, in the example above, I talked about loop, but you, you can also sell it to in a channel marketplace. You can say, oh, look, I'll open a channel to your node, and, uh, and, and then you can use its route, and it costs this much to open this channel. You can sell it, obviously, through routing fees um, if you open a channel to loop, or you can sell it through a channel closing fee. I think um, a new swap service, uh, DT.io, is like, trying out this model of they pay you on closing instead of on opening the channel. But in, in either case, what you end up with is a situation where you want to get inbound liquidity, um, and you're willing to pay any price that's lower than what you can earn either by having a channel with loop or by selling a channel inbound marketplace or by getting a closing fee from some other soft service, right? So it, it, th this, this kind of um, arbitrage means that any service that's offering cheaper swaps than Loop is going to get arbitrage. They're going to have to charge more because people will be able to just like buy it until they're kind of like out of money. Um, and it also leads to this kind of stability of prices for inbound liquidity on the network. And I think this, this, this is like the best way that I, I, I know to demonstrate this effect of the, the arbitrage. So here's some historical data, going back two years-ish, on the price of inbound liquidity on the Lightning Network. On the bottom, we just have the on-chain fees for reference. Uh, but on the top, we have two very different ways that you can get inbound liquidity on the Lightning Network. So the first way is, obviously, you can 
buy a channel. And that's in green here, these pool leases. Pool is a, it's just a channel marketplace where you can buy incoming channels. That's the first way I told you that you get, can get inbound liquidity by getting someone to open a channel to you. And we, we found out that it costs about 0.25% you know, of the channel's capacity to buy a new channel. Okay, and that seems to be pretty constant throughout time in terms of high on-chain fees and low on-chain fees. There's this premium for getting a new channel. And it turns out that you can also plot the median capacity weighted inbound routing fees to the loop node, and you get a very similar number. Um, so why am I plotting the inbound routing fees to loop? Well, it turns out that those, are, those routing fees to get to the loop node in the first place are, end up being like the biggest cost when you're looping out. Um, so this is kind of, these routing fees are kind of a proxy for how much it costs to get in my liquidity uh, by using submarine swaps. And so whether you're using submarine swaps or whether you're like doing your own channel operations, you're paying someone to open a channel to you, the end result's the same. You're paying about 0.25% uh, for inbound liquidity. So for every Satoshi of inbound liquidity that, that you buy, you're gonna have to pay 0 0.25 Satoshis for that, okay? And this kind of market price for inbound liquidity, no matter how you get it, ends up having some very nice implications if you're operating a bank. So let's go back, yeah, going back to the beginning of the talk where I talked about bank, in like a, in a world where Bitcoin succeeded, and there's lots of Bitcoin banks, and they're all interoperable, there's gonna be intense competition bec between where you put your money, right? Because in an instant, you can take your money in this bank and move it all to an another bank. Uh, so if the bank you're with right now is, is overcharging for fees or, you know, for whatever reason you don't like it, you can leave, you should be able to leave very easily. And so you, as a, if you're gonna be a sustainable bank, you need to have your fees as low as possible. But at the same time, this inbound liquidity arbitrage means that you have to, you have to really pay attention to things like fees for depositing on Lightning or withdrawing on chain. Because if the sum of those ends up being less than the market rate, then you're, you're kind of a target for arbitrage, right? People can use the bank to move their Bitcoin off chain on chain and buy inbound liquidity from the bank, basically. And if, if that price is cheaper than buying it, than, than what they can get from selling it to a swap service or from selling it to a channel marketplace, then you're gonna be in trouble. You're basically gonna be uh, arbitrage. The people are gonna keep doing this until the, the fees you end up paying to have to continue offering liquidity just totally bankrupt the bank. So you end up having to pick a fee structure that still charges very low fees if someone is in arbitrage with the bank, right? Because again, you, you're subject to this brutal competition, but you have to charge the, the correct fees for ar if, if someone is arbitraging, right? You, you wanna charge this market rate if someone is only receiving off-chain and sending on-chain. And <coughs> that's kind of what we end up discussing in the paper, we kind of discuss a few different formulas that you can use to like apply to either lightning deposits, which probably doesn't make sense because it kind of goes against the UX of Bitcoin, but we apply them to on-chain payments. So it goes over some formulas you can apply to like how much you should charge to make an on-chain payment from a lightning wallet um, and what kind of the effects for the user experience might be for that. And we discussed that all in this paper published last year, although it says 2022, it should not. Uh, yeah, so please read that if you, if you are all wondering, if you're running a wallet and you, you're thinking about what the fee should be for on-chain transactions, that's the place to go. And now I can take any questions. Thank you so much. There's a question in the back here. Oh. Did they pick? Um, we have the, com uh, the microphone coming here. Thank you so much, Jose. Brilliant. 
Thanks. How do you identify non-arbitraging users versus arbitraging users in this model? Right. Well, you identify them by their activity, right? So the, the, the kind of idea is you want to charge for the actual impact of a user's usage on, on, your, on your liquidity pools. If a user is draining one liquidity pool and like increasing another one, that then you know they're probably using you to arbitrage. So you, the, the fees end up being kind of commensurate with the, the costs, the market costs. So this assumes persistent user identity. You're not being smurfed or something yes. like that. Yes. That's a very good point. And so in a, hmm, obviously Bitcoin Beach Wallet right now is you know, we have very light KYC. You just need a phone number to sign up. And so it's not like we're like tracking people's like uh, real world identity in any sense, um, at least for small amounts. Uh, but yeah, in like a, a future where banks that know some kind of identity, some kind of pseudonymous maybe identity about their users are competing with banks that don't know anything about their users including like, has this user ever made a transaction to, with this bank before? The, the latter banks, the completely anonymous banks, will have to charge higher fees um, unless you know, some new things get figured out in a way that you can. But yeah, you need at least pseudonymity in order to be able to charge very low fees uh, as a bank. Hi. Ah, hi. Um, I'm wondering if, if you could uh, estimate, guesstimate, uh, what the uh, rate of return for a person who wants to put some Bitcoin in Lightning Network to work is uh, going to pan out. Like if, if it's going to be 1%, if it's going to be less than that, if it's going to be more than that. What's your take? Oh, I think it's very variable, obviously. But, uh, well, something I was thinking about is like, most of us who aren't running Lightning businesses, if you're just like me, you just like put Bitcoin in Lightning channels so you can pay with your, your, your Lightning Bitcoin without having high on-chain fees, uh, you're mostly going the opposite direction, right? You're mostly going from off-chain outbound out, meaning you get inbound liquidity every time you make a payment. And so you can kind of, I think it, it's like, it's something I do and it's something everyone should do, I think. It's like once you've like drained your channels, just open a channel with loop and sell all that inbound liquidity you accumulated when you were making payments. And so you, it's kind of like, uh, you know, a, a small percentage cash back almost. Um, so that it's just like another thing that does actually contribute to the benefits of running a node, I guess. Hey, uh, do you think that there's a place for circular rebalancing at all in a mature lightning ecosystem? Well, actually that's a, another great question. So, in, when you close a channel, I think I did this intentionally. Yeah, when you close a channel, usually it's not going to be 100% full, right? N your channels never actually get uh, really full like that. Uh, so it does make sense sometimes to like do a little circular balance to fill up your channel and then close it. So you can get a little bit more bang for your buck on on-chain transaction fees if you're trying to get more amount of liquidity. I think that's probably, maybe that and like just-in-time routing, that I don't think that's possible yet, but that's probably a good way to use circular rebalancing, I would say. Hey, uh, great talk, and I had a look through the paper a little while back, and I had a quick chat with Nicholas about oh, it yeah, yeah. as well. I thought it was cool. Um, so as I understand, one way to think of it is if you are a, an exchange or a provider, you have to think of it like you're protecting your liquidity by charging enough of a fee so that you don't get exploited, right? I guess yes. that's the high-level understanding. And so then as we speak today, do you, do you like, I guess, obviously, this, obviously it varies where you are on the graph, how many channels, all this stuff. But at a high level, does that mean you should be charging, say, 0.3, 0.4%, something like that, to stop someone exploiting you? Is that kind of like a rough estimation? Well, you can charge less if you know that they're not going to exploit you, right? Because you, if you know that, like, in the future, that same user is going to receive off-chain, too, and not, or, or send off-chain, too, and receive on-chain, then it makes sense to charge them less. 
than 0.5% or 0.3%. Um, that's kind of what we try to, the kind of trade-off we try to balance in, in the paper, which is like, obviously you shouldn't charge the market rate always because that can be, that can be, that can deter usage basically. Um, oh. And we also have some, some copies of the paper if anyone wants to read them. I, I plugged it without giving you access to a copy, but we have some copies here at the front. Thanks to Andrew. Quick comment on his question is that actually when people upcharge you, you're not being vulnerable because uh, you earn the time value. You get your money back immediately. The one upcharge, you have to wait until someone pay higher fee to gain that profit. So it's not really you're being vulnerable for being like, it will be taking advantage when people use your node to do circular rebalancing. But my question right now is, is like, uh, for, uh, I know the reason some people use uh, loop is because when the past finding algorithm, it rewards good reputation, reputation channels. That's why you don't want to close the channel. Yes. But for a lot of the uh, sync or exchange, because it's like they are the destiny of the the flow. So there's actually right now the loop fee is higher than the on-chain fee. So I don't understand why they use loop. Well, I think that's a great point. That I talked about the second order effect of yeah, if you close your channels really fast, you might get higher inbound fees. But there's also this problem of reputation. If you close a lot of channels, uh you know, maybe the routing algorithm won't want to route through you because they, they won't be sure whether maybe it just closed and so then it's like less likely to succeed your route. So the second order effects of doing a lot of channel operations are very complicated and very, you know, include lots of things that I haven't even accounted for, but that's why something like a submarine swap is so nice because you don't have to worry about that. It kind of simplifies it. Okay, some more questions there. And the th a third row, and uh, one in the back also, I guess. Hi there, thanks for your talk. Um, just when you're sending a request to the swap service provider for volume, um, what is there in the protocol that um, makes sure that the swap service provider doesn't become a potential point of failure, um, particularly if there's a, you know, a market that's very volatile, there's a high volume of liquidations, um, what, what is there in the protocol to make sure that the swap provider isn't taking a request that it can't ultimately fulfill? That's a, also a question I have. I think the operations of manage, if you're running a swap service, you can, I think there's a lot to optimize. And so there, there is like some kind of um, possibility that like there could be competition between swap service provider who can like do the swap most efficiently and most safely you know, um, both in using on-chain space by batching transactions smartly or, or uh, having some smart way to like allocate your capital into the different pools when you're providing the swap service. Um, so yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see that play out. We'll see the, the effects of that play out in the future as like DC and Loop and Bolt and all of these swap service providers compete. Um, but yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I don't really know the answer. I, I, yeah, I think it would take a lot of research. Hi. Yeah, say I'm a naturally sort of high volume balanced node and my use case, I, I'm non-arbitraging. What, what's the disadvantage to me other than maybe leaving money on the table for selling my liquidity? when selling my liquidity. What's the, is there a, a secondary disadvantage or a community, a community level sort of second order effect that I'm missing here? Like what, w why the focus on not getting arbitraged? Oh, because um, obviously if you like sell inbound liquidity for cheap, if people just buy it and then you're out and you can't sell anymore, there's no problem. You just lost a little money, no, no big deal. But if you're continuously making it available, that, that costs you. And so if you're paying more than what you're selling it for, you're just gonna be draining money. And the more people use your servers, the more you're gonna drain. It's just not sustainable, that's, you know. 
Okay, any more questions? Okay, great. Jose, thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Um, lots of questions. We're getting into this conference groove, I guess. <laughs>